Last time we took a critical look at that Gaussian reduction system that we had set up in pseudocode and we realized there were three possible outcomes. The first possibility was that it would solve our system quickly and efficiently. The second possibility was we would have some zero lying in the main diagonal and we would trip over it and divide by zero which would cause the system to blow. The third possibility was the worst, and that was we had a very small value in the main diagonal, and we actually got the wrong answer, and there was nobody there to tell us there was a problem. So that needs fixing, and our first step in fixing the problem will be with a tool which we call simple partial pivoting. Now before I turn to my two by two example, I want you to recall that the problem we had with the 2x2 two two is we had a very small value we called epsilon in the upper left hand corner of the A matrix. There's really no reason why we couldn't swap rows and put that, that guilty value in row 2. So what you're going to look at here is that having been accomplished. My matrix A is the same matrix I had before with row 1 and row 2 swapped. And of course we've got to swap the values of B to match the change in the rows of A. Notice we don't change our X vector. The, the X vector, the solution vector, remains the same because it doesn't really matter what order you lay your linear equations in. Uh, the X1 is still X1 and X2 is still X2. Uh, so if we did that We've now solved our problem because we have a very dominant value in the main diagonal and we have small values in the off diagonal or in the other parts of the matrix. So let's just work that out with floating point arithmetic by hand just like we did before and take a look at where the differences are. Well, we now are subtracting a fraction of row 1 from row 2, but this coefficient is the reciprocal of what we used last time. Let's just see what happens when we do that. We get our desired 0 in the lower left hand corner. We still get 1 minus epsilon and 2 minus epsilon in certain locations, and when we do the floating point arithmetic, the same thing is going to happen as before, namely that if you try to subtract a normal size number from a tiny one, uh, in other words, we try to subtract two numbers with really different mantises, then the tiny number is going to just disappear. So in effect, we get what's on the right-hand side when the epsilon goes away. Well, let's just continue to work that. We have another step that we need to go with. We need to do the backward substitution. Uh, so we know immediately that x2 is equal to 1, and we can use the first row to form a linear combination using the known value of x2. If we do that, we end up getting x1 is equal to 2 minus 1, or x1 is equal to 1. That is the correct solution. That's the solution that we got by hand. That's not the solution we got before when we had not rearranged the rows of A and the, and the entries of B. Is there a systematic way we can go about taking advantage of proper row order? And the answer is yes. Uh, we will use this tool called simple partial pivoting. It's called partial pivoting because we are only going to look within a single column to look for an alternative swapping of rows. And the approach we will use is to look down the first column for the value, for the entry, that has the largest value in magnitude. In other words, it is the most extreme value, either most extreme positive or most extreme negative, uh, and we are going to use that as the candidate for a new pivot location. Well, clearly 12 is our biggest number in magnitude, and so we want to swap row 2 with row 1 before we do any other row reduction. And here's our result. 12 is now in the very first position and we are ready to go ahead and proceed with the Gaussian reduction. Let's copy that matrix to this new slide so we can see what we're doing. And I'll set up three row transformations at once. 
that will change the first column positions in row 2, row 3, and row 4 by appropriate linear combinations. And there we have the zeros that we wanted to have before with the 12 left alone. Okay, so that's a pretty simple change, but as we see in a moment, it is going to be uh, very helpful and not give us any trouble downstream. Uh, you might think that we are just uh, putting off problems by rearranging the rows and they might show up somewhere else, but decades of practice using this thing indicate that it just doesn't run into trouble. So now we're ready to look at the lower 3x3 three three matrix. In other words, this portion of the system uh, because we would like to now continue with the reduction in column two. Well, we're going to do the same thing. We are going to look for the value that gives us the largest magnitude, which in this case is minus 11. So let's copy this entire system over to the next page where we can work with it. And here it is. And clearly minus 11 is the largest value in magnitude. So we will rearrange rows two and row three and create a new pivot location in this in the 2 2 position. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the row reduction. Uh, let's copy again that uh, matrix to the uh, next slide and we'll set up the appropriate row reduction transformations and we'll focus on putting zeros in both these locations. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, we've already got a zero down here in the fourth row, and that was just good luck. We don't really, uh, we, we can't guarantee that that will always occur, and so our algorithms have to work whether it's already a zero or not. So this second uh, statement here is somewhat of a no operation, but we'll probably program that in anyway. So now we have succeeded in uh, correcting both columns one and columns two. We're almost done. We still have this four down here in the lowest row to take care of, and we'll do the same thing. We'll look at the two by two system in the lower right hand corner. So copying the previous matrix that we had onto this page, we clearly have four as being the largest in magnitude among those two. So we would like to go ahead and rearrange those two rows. We now have the four in the diagonal position, and then we will uh, continue to do the row reduction that we need to do. Uh, to make that clear, let's copy this entire uh, matrix over to the next page, and we'll finish the job uh, by doing the proper row transformation in R4. So, uh, so when we do that, we get now our coveted zeros in the lower portion of the matrix, which means we are now in lower triangular form. This is way more stable. You never have to worry about a zero showing up in the main diagonal. The reason for that is if it did, it would have meant that the system was singular and you couldn't have solved it anyway. So we will have to teach our code to check to make sure if we have a singular system as we go, but uh, assuming that it's full rank, that will never occur. Now that we have completed the demonstration using this 4x4 system of Gaussian reduction with simple partial pivoting integrated, we need to turn this into an algorithm that could be applied for any matrix of any size. So let's go ahead and see what we really need to do to change the row reduction algorithm. Well, the main thing is to learn how to swap one row with another. So if I would like to swap, say, row 1 and row 2, I would need to start with column 1. And here we have the element at row 2 and column 1 being moved into its corresponding position into row 1. We would need to do that for all the other columns as well, and that would succeed in taking the entire row 2 and moving it to row 1. So I have succeeded in moving row two to row one, but I've also clobbered every value in row one and I can't get it back. So I'll never be able to get row one into row two. What I need to do instead is be a little more careful and tuck away each value as I read it before I do overwriting. So if I look at these three lines of code below, what I first do is take 
the data that's stored at the address a11, store it in a temporary variable x, now go ahead and clobber a11 with a21, but I have the old value in x that I can put down into row two and column one. So these three lines will succeed in moving in one column a value in row two to row one and the corresponding value in row one to row two. Now that is not much of an investment of extra memory. It cost me one extra floating point real. I do need to repeat all three of those lines for every column in the matrix, but I don't need to keep inventing a new variable x. I can keep reusing that over and over again and thereby uh, allocate very little memory in the safe way of swapping row one and row two. Well, let's now generalize that a little bit. I'm going to have to be able to swap any two arbitrary rows to make this algorithm work. I also need to use a for loop to walk across all the columns. So these three lines of code here that we're looking at are almost exactly the same as the one on the previous page. The only difference is, is instead of insisting I, I swap between row one and row two, I'm swapping between row i and row k. So that is the only difference I need to make to make that process work and successfully swap two rows of A. Don't forget B though, the corresponding B value in row I and row K, rather I should say entry I and entry K, must be swapped also and therefore we should use the exact same logic as we did before. This code succeeds in swapping rows I and K in the matrix A as well as entries I and K in the vector b. Now we could take our code we already wrote in homework 2.1 and we could integrate this code at the appropriate place where needed and that would allow us to do partial pivoting and the row reduction at the same time. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's complete the algorithm integrating the partial pivoting into its appropriate place keeping in mind that we only need to do this in the triangularization step. We will not need to do it in back substitution. So the partial pivoting just rearranges rows A and entries B in the triangularization process. Once that's done, the same method that we used in 2.1 must be employed. You're just reordering the rows first to make sure you've maximized the diagonal entry. Once that's done, there's no risk of that diagonal entry being zero. Well, unless A is singular, then it could still be zero. So we may need to do a rank check in there to make sure we don't get into problem using a less than full rank system. Our revised algorithm still delivers an upper triangular matrix, so we just apply the back substitution without change. And uh, to do that, you just copy the script used in 2.1 and reuse it. Now just a couple of side notes, there are still some improvements we're going to make which are covered in the next section. Partial pivoting takes you a long way in protecting your algorithm, uh, but there's a few other things we'll need to do in 2.2b as well. And then there's a new feature in 2.2c that we'll want to look at, which we'll talk about when we get there. So here's your homework, 2.2a homework. Uh, again, comment the procedure just as we always do. The first thing I want you to do is take a new data set that I'm emailing to you, another Excel file. It's going to have data set A2, a matrix, a 10 by 10 matrix, and it's going to have a, an appropriate B vector to go with it. As step one, just run your old code from homework 2.1 and see what happens. It's not going to work well, and I want you to tell me what happens and why it went wrong. Then I want you to fix it by integrating in the partial pivoting into this copy of 2.1. Do the partial pivoting. Uh, forget that term about row scaling. We're going to get to that later. Uh, swap the applicable rows in the uh, triangularization process. Solve the system using the data in A2, and this time you'll succeed at it. And don't forget to calculate the floating point operations. That is required. When, when you're all done, take the norm of the residual vector and don't accomplish that using any MATLAB function. And there's some ideas of things you might like to print out, but again, printing is optional. It's just a good idea. So that now takes us to the end of section 2.2b. And uh, in 2.2c, we're going to make even some further improvements. 
for this process. We'll see you then.